Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Offspring Magazine podcast. I'm your host today, Xiao Ran. Nico will join me today. Who's our guest today, Nico? So yeah, today we will be speaking to Alicia Bayer. She's a doctor who specializes in reproductive health care. And uh, I actually met her brother um, over a recent summer school I took, and he introduced me to her. And that's how we got to the interview. And like this was all during the um, Roe v. Wade case happening in the States. And then you also had the uh, ruling of the 219A article in Germany. So, I mean, generally, this abortion is just a very in, uh, important topic. Um, so that's why uh, we wanted to talk to her about this and see what she thinks and what her, what her um, opinions are. And with this, I don't want to uh, further keep you waiting. And then we will just move right into the interview. Alicia Bayer, join our podcast. Welcome, Dr. Alicia Bayer. Would you like to introduce yourself at first, please? Yes, good, good morning. Thank you for the invitation. My name is uh, Alicia Bayer. I am a medical doctor based in Berlin, specializing in obstetrics and gynecology. And I'm a co-founder and board member of Doctors for Choice Germany. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really great to have you here. And um, I mean, this whole topic is uh, very uh, complicated, I think. And from my perspective, also not easy to understand. So maybe can you first tell us like uh, how you got interested in this? Because I mean, you're a medical doctor by training, uh, but it's not it's a specialization as far as I, I know. Um, mm, the specialization is gynecology and obstetrics. And normally abortion should be part of that training but um, that's one of the problems that uh, many hospitals don't provide abortions um, for example because the head of the department um, is against abortion and doesn't mm -hmm. want them to be provided in his hospital or her hospital and um, so it's not automatically that you learn uh, that you get abortion training during your specialization but i got in contact with abortions already during my medical studies so at the university when i attended a feminist lecture of heinrich böll foundation and uh, in this lecture i i met a very fascinating doctor and activist from the netherlands her name is rebecca gumpert and she got me in contact with a student organization called Medical Students for Choice. They are a global organization and they are dedicated um, to integrate abortion care into medical education because um, the problem mm -hmm. of lacking education already starts at the universities. So it's a, it's a common problem that abortions are often not taught at universities, even if they are um, a very frequent gynecological procedure. And yeah, I then found out that this is also a German problem and that uh, abortions weren't taught at my own university at Charité, which is the biggest university hospital in Europe. And um, I then founded uh, the first German chapter of Medical Students for Choice in Berlin. and. Um, we started um, organizing so-called papaya workshops where medical students can explore how a surgical abortion is performed by using a papaya as a uterus model. And um, yeah, these workshops get very popular and a lot of media attention. And uh, that helped us to get in conversations with uh, our university with the head of our university and um, we finally could uh, change our medical syllabus with mm -hmm. an additional seminar on abortion because um, until then abortion 
didn't come up within the six years of medical studies mm -hmm. at all. Um, yeah, and now there's a somehow German-wide student movement. Uh, so there have um, been founded other student groups at other German universities trying to improve their medical education. And yeah, it, that's a really nice movement, movement that has grown mm -hmm. from, from that now. Uh, no, during medical studies, you normally learn everything in theory. So it's not so much about the practical um, practical performance. Um, but exactly, abortion didn't come up theoretically during um, this these six years of medical studies. Only the legal aspects were um, touched, you could say but only on the side of a seminar that was mainly about another topic about prenatal diagnostics. So yeah, there was no chance to learn about how abortions are performed, what methods are there, what side effects, um, how can you counsel a patient? Um, follow up question and we can continue. Uh, because you just mentioned that you use the papaya as a model to uh, conduct the abortion experiment and I heard from a friend and he told me in Germany since it's not legal to protect uh, practice abortion surgery then they said some medical students they use avocado to do this uh, surgery is it true avocado oh, I haven't <laughs> heard of that I think it wouldn't uh, work maybe he meant papaya I could imagine maybe he was confounding it because the the good thing about the papaya is that you can suction the the inner part of the papaya which i think wouldn't work in an avocado mm -hmm. so it's really a good model and and the workshop we didn't invent that in berlin it, it comes from the us it's um there has all, also been publications scientific publications about that it's the best model we have because it's so um fragile also um, because in a normal uterus you can perforate when you do the the suction and, and that can also happen with the papaya so it's quite a good model and i i mean i performed abortions later in in, in persons and uh, i i can say it's it's quite similar actually the feeling of it yeah mm -hmm. Okay, before we maybe get uh, into uh, like what an abortion actually is, like uh, from a also surgical point of view, maybe can you tell us what your experience is more on the ethical side? Uh, like, um, why is such a polarizing topic? Um, and I mean, you've been in some talk shows as far as I remember. So uh, what was the, um, the, I guess, the atmosphere when discussing this uh, kind of topic? Yeah, that's a very um, important question. I think in the German context during the last decades in the in the public debate and also in the legal debate, um, the the focus has very much been on the embryo, and um, it's often framed as an, in my opinion, artificial conflict between the embryo and the pregnant person and they are played off against each other and um, very often in the German debate it, it has been forgotten that the embryo is not autonomous and it's not able to exist without a person sacrificing a lot by carrying a pregnancy to term and giving birth and also in these um, talk shows um, from some parties the focus is only on the embryo and um, for, forgetting that we have human rights on this uh, topic, international human rights recommendations that uh, focus on, on um, reproductive health and that um, yeah focus on, on women's health and um, that's often forgotten. And I think um, there are two important reasons historically um, why abortions 
as such a uh, polarized and criti cri critical question in society. So um, one factor is uh, population policy. So historically, many many states uh, have introduced abortion bans to increase the birth rate and have more people as a workforce and as soldiers. So that's also the history of our own paragraph 218, which um, criminalizes abortion still up until today. And it was introduced into the criminal code in 1871 after Germany had lost many um, wars and um, the, the aim was to, yeah, to have more workforce. Um, so, th so this point is about the, the product of pregnancy, you could say, and the other motivation to restrict abortions is uh, part of an anti-feminist anti agenda trying to control women's bodies and um, oppressing their free choice and their possibility to live an independent life and participate in society and trying to restrict them um, back to stereotype gender roles and to their role as mother and housewife. And um, we see that right now. It's a, it's a growing European anti-choice movement uh, consisting of different players ranging from conservatives to Christian fundamentalists up to right-wing nationalists. And they all agree on this anti-feminist anti core element that abortion is. Since we're on this anti-feminism topic, I would like to, like, uh, if uh, I ask you to describe feminism, like, uh, related to abortion, how would you describe this feminism, like, related to abortion? What is feminism? Because so many people nowadays, when you mention a feminism, they already get annoyed. They don't want to listen to you further. They think feminism is a like negative word now. So I would like if you could this like just to describe what is feminism, which is related to abortion. I think it would be helpful for some people who has the let's say misunderstood stood concept about this concept. Okay, yes, um, yeah, so abortion is, is a very important uh, co component of uh, feminism um, because in, in feminism it's about gender equity and that all um, genders have the same uh, rights and chances yeah, to, to lead an independent life of their own choice. And now we have the situation that roughly half of all persons have an uterus and are able to become pregnant and the other half hasn't got an uterus and the half that has got the uterus are most often women not always because they're also trans trans men and non-binary people but it's mostly women and um, so it's it's an inequality that we have that some people are more affected than others from from um, the uh, consequences of having sexual intercourse. And yeah, a society cannot be equal if not everyone has the possibility to decide on, on their own family planning. Um, yeah, maybe this can explain it. Yeah, no, I mean, I, maybe if I may add a bit, like, I think this, uh, it adds, like, there's this burden on keeping, like, the population going, like, kind of what you mentioned in the first part, right? And this burden is mainly on women, right? And this, uh, but then uh, it makes such a huge cut in a person's life um, to uh, to have a child and so on that, uh, yeah. Yeah, you're... you're... The, the care work uh, is, is most often done by women. So it's not only about pregnancy and giving birth, but also about raising a child for the next uh, 20 years. And this burden is, is um, much more on women. But I mean, there are voices who say, yeah, OK, then you could adopt, give, give, give the um, baby free to adoption after birth. But still, it's, it's a very um, harming a pregnancy and, and giving birth is not just done 
it's, it's not just an easy thing you do without any complications. It's much more, there are much more medical complications than having an early abortion and also the psychological effects on, on carrying an unwanted pregnancy to term that's, that's like, um, like folter, <laughs> uh, torture, torture. That's, that's like torture. Um, I, I know that from my own experience that those patients who decided to have an abortion and then still have to wait because of certain barriers that occur for them every other day having to go on with this pregnancy and you, you notice the effect of the pregnancy. For example, you have nausea or you, you, you notice it growing in your body. And for them, it's really every day feels like a whole week. It's, it's, yeah. And I think it's like 10 months pregnancy. You can, if you're working in chemistry, you cannot go to lab anymore. Your career will be affected as, as like as well. I think, yeah, I think you're, it's it's reasonable to let female have the choice, have the right to decide the, the plan for family, decide. The, I, yeah, I think this is a feminism. You're right. Yes, like and there's, a, there's, there's an interesting study called the Turnaway Study, and they examined thousands of um, women who were denied an, a wanted abortion, and they had to carry on with the pregnancy and raise the ch children and they found out that the financial situation of those women is um, much worse of a control group where women could get their wanted abortion and that they yeah had were more likely to stay in a relationship with a violent partner their children um, were raised in more poverty with less educational um, opportunities and uh, the, the other group with a wanted um, abortion were more likely to have later on uh, desired children. So it's a, it's, there's a homepage um, uh, summing up all these results. It's, it's called the Turnaway Study. And it's, it's... No, that sounds great. Maybe we can put it in the um, comment section or in the inform information section of the podcast interview. All right, then now that we've talked already so much about abortion, maybe can you quickly explain to us what an abortion is specifically and, and also maybe get into the like um, the s surgery itself? Like what does it mean to do an abortion? Uh, yeah, an abortion is an induced termination of pregnancy by using either medication or a surgical procedures pr procedure. So medication abortion, you um, basically take one pill that uh, stops the pregnancy um, to grow uh, anymore. And then two days later, you take um, the other pills that um, cause cramping of the uterus and um, expulsion of the pregnancy. And the surgical procedure uh, can be done in full or local anesthesia. It takes about five to 10 minutes. So it's a small surgical intervention and um, you access the uterus uh, vaginally, um, you dilate the cervix and then you insert a tube and you, um, you use uh, under pressure. So, um, suction, under pressure. I guess, is that what? Suction, yeah. And, and then you use, use, you suction um, the pregnancy out. So this is the vacuum aspiration and it's um, the recommended surgical method. But there's another outdated surgical method that unfortunately is still used in Germany in more than every 10th abortion. It's called curettage and there you also access the uterus vaginally, but you use um, something like a metal spoon and you scrap on the um, 
on the endometrium, so on the um, uterus tissue, and you, you scrap the pregnancy out. And this is um, a lot more harmful and, um, yeah, should not be used anymore. It's outdated for decades. And, yeah, it <laughs> really annoys me that it's still used in Germany. I mean, you mentioned before that during the training that it can you can puncture the uterus, right? So I perforate. assume like if you go perforate, thanks, yeah. Uh, and so if you do that with a metal object, that might be even easier, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. it, the risk is higher and it's more bleeding mm -hmm. and it's more risk of causing scarring. And um, there's a syndrome called Ascherman syndrome. And that um, could also mean that it's more difficult then to become pregnant at a later stage. But that's only with this outdated method. So with the modern methods, that's no risk because it's it's often said by uh, anti-abortionist um, activists that abortion is so harmful and so complicated it can lead to infertility and depression and trauma. And this is all not true. So uh, abortions are very safe. Um, they don't affect your probability to become pregnant at a later point uh, if conducted with modern methods. And um, they are also mentally uh, tolerated very well. So most often the, the dominant, predominant feeling after an abortion is relief. Um, sometimes there can be temporary sadness, um, but very rarely it ends up in, an, in a depression. Maybe uh, on this point, um, how like if someone comes to you that wants an abortion so how do you first approach this whole thing i i, f I first ask uh, if the person is um sure that she wants the abortion and i don't um ask explicitly um, to give me reasons for the abortion just if if the person wants to talk about that or is ambivalent then of course but um it's not a requirement and then I uh, do an ultrasound, we look how far the pregnancy is and which um, methods can be used because medication abortion only uh, can be used up to nine weeks of pregnancy in Germany. And uh, then I give information about the two methods and the person can um, decide on the method and Okay. Yeah. Thanks. It's just. I mean, it's hard to generally uh, know what this is like. Uh, like, as I mean, I guess uh, for me especially. Um, but it's good to know that this is like a very regulated or like a nice process where it's um, you try to make the people comfortable. I assume because it's not an easy decision. Uh, yes. 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 But um, there are also different situations in Germany. Uh, very often in many regions, people don't have. The possibility to choose the method because um, the um, there are not a lot of uh, providing facilities. Um, that's a German-wide problem that we have less and less abortion providers, and so for them it means they have to travel long distances. Um, they experience sometimes a lot of stigma, um, also um, from health professionals, um, and yeah. They not always can choose uh, the method. Okay, maybe we can quickly, or maybe uh, if you could give us some information about like how often abortions occur, because like I mean, generally because the topic is so stigmatized, I heard that um, a lot of women or people need to get abortions or will get some at some point, but uh, don't talk about it at all. So I just wanted to ask, like, uh, like how many abortions, uh, or if you know if you, how many abortions generally happen, um, yeah. And also maybe if this, uh, like, maybe going then into the uh, topic of the uh, recent repeal of this uh, Article Twenty Nineteen A, uh, like, if like what kind of things actually can, uh, like, help pre either prevent abortions or also. Um, make them like more healthy i guess mm -hmm. perform them. yes yeah um so in germany we have 100,000 abortions per year this 
number has stayed quite stable during mm -hmm. the last years and to get an idea it's almost as frequent as an appendectomy so it's a oh. very frequent mm -hmm. uh, intervention and um, there's a study from the US uh, showing that every fourth woman will have an abortion during her lifetime mm -hmm. and um, it's true mm -hmm. that many people think that um, abortions are very rare and um, I also noticed that in my patients that they are very surprised when they uh, get to know that they are so frequent because yeah it's a, a taboo maintaining itself because no one talks about it and then this impression of um, them being rare uh, is, is maintained and then people who have an abortion think that they are yeah an exception and they feel bad and yeah that's a problem in general to answer your question um abortions are safest and um we have less abortions in countries in general with liber liberal abortion laws um where sexual health education um, plays a, a big role where um, access to contraception is good and where there are um, where there is social support for those um, for for parents um, and by contrast countries with very restrictive um, abortion laws don't have lower abortion rates so criminal restrictions are not able to reduce the number of abortions but by contrast they increase unsafe abortions maternal mortality and black market and still each year 27,000 uh, women die because of uh, unsafe abortions worldwide since now the article 298 is uh, repealed and uh, I actually I don't know the situation now, but I just did some investigation in Germany. If you want to do an abortion, you need to go to the consultant, right? Like you need to talk with someone if it's uh, uh, necessary, then you can get certificates and you can approach doctor. Do you think this pro do you think I think between there's three days like you need to think about it, like it's mandatory like the whole process do you think it's necessary like what kind of a new situation you would like to let's say wish like what kind of uh, abortion situation you would think okay it should be safe for everyone and it also can improve the awareness of society they have enough awareness what they're doing like if you want to do abortion you know what you're doing and you also can do it safely Yes, um, now that 219A is abolished, that just means that doctors can now provide neutral information about abortion on their website. But as you said uh, correctly, we still have paragraph 218 and 219 and um, abortion is still uh, regulated in the criminal code and we have this um, yeah, um, obligation waiting period of three days and this um, obligatory counseling and um, um, yeah and these this three days waiting period and the obligatory counseling are actually barriers to to access an abortion as as quickly as you can it delays the process and we know that abortions are safest the earliest they are performed um, and also it's a lot of psychological stress in a situation where the decision has already been taken for most and um but you still have to do these bureaucratic steps um and it's a lot of stress and at the same time you have a limit of 12 weeks and you know that after these 12 weeks you would have go to another country to do the um, abortion because it um it won't be possible in germany anymore on request at least um so there are also clear recommendations of the World Health Organization and uh, human rights organizations to abolish these uh, medically unnecessary barriers. And um, but so what we need is decriminalization of abortion. Um, 
which would include the abolition of the waiting period and the counseling. Um, but we need more things. So um, the, the problem is also that um, <clears throat> abortions are not covered by health insurance. So you have to pay the costs by yourself. It's between 300 to 600 euros, depending on the method. Um, if you earn little, you, you have the chance to get the abortion refunded, but then you have to go through further bureaucratic uh, steps to, to get this uh, refunding, um, which might delay the procedure further. And um, so when we decriminalize abortion, what we need is a, a real legalization, meaning a um, regulation that guarantees safe and timely access to abortion care and that um, yeah, regulates that contraception and abortion are covered by the health insurance. And also important is to um, regulate things like who can provide abortions. Because as I said, we have this problem of less and less um, physicians who want to provide abortions, which um, um, really leads to problems of access in, in some regions in, in Germany. And um, one solution could be that you allow nurses and midwives to perform abortions. That's something that happens in other countries and it has become crucial to, to guarantee access. But in Germany, we still have this um, yeah, very old fashioned rule in the criminal code that only doctors can provide abortions, um, which is something that also is against recommendations of World Health Organization, because then it very much depends on their will to to perform abortions or not and um, doctors and all health professionals have the right to object abortion provision on on personal crowns and that's something we don't have in medicine in general but we have it in this area um yeah so this task shift would be an option to to uh, improve access and another problem we have in Germany is the so-called Gestaltbelästigungen. In, in, in German, it's called like that. It's uh, meaning harassment uh, towards health professionals and abortion seekers in front of counseling sites and doctors' offices. So this is a problem in many cities. They are holding up um, pictures with embryos, or um, they are. Um, sorry, I have to look up a word. They are praying and um, yeah, that can be very uncomfortable for, for a person seeking an abortion, of course. Um, and in some states, there are uh, so-called bubble zone protections. So, so there are laws that guarantee that these people don't harass, um, that, that they are not allowed to harass in front of, of those institutions. Um, yeah, so these are, I think, the most important steps uh, we we have to do now. And I just wanted to say that, uh, I mean, you can um, cut it out afterwards if you want, but um, um, our our law, our abortion law that we have now is is very outdated. It's from the nineties, and it. Um, it basically tries to protect the embryo's life by by stating that the pregnant person has a general obligation to carry a pregnancy to term. It's called Austragungspflicht. Um, and and the measures the state takes to to do that because actually he can't the state can't go into the uterus and protect the embryo. It's not it's not possible. He can't go between the woman and the embryo. So the only thing he can do and he tries to do is to to um, to impose these barriers to access an abortion, like the oblig obligational counseling and the three days waiting period. But this measure doesn't work. It can't reduce the number of abortions, so it will not protect a single embryo's life. Um, but instead, it it causes a lot of harm to the to the pregnant person. Yeah. Yeah, so I think there's really time to to think about good measures to 
maybe reduce the abortion rate a little bit, for example, by by covering contraception um, with the health insurance. But still, we always have to keep in mind that contraception is not protecting and preventing pregnancies 100%. So there is uh, just a statistical probability that they can fail. So we always will have unwanted pregnancies and we, we have to find measures to deal with them. Since you mentioned about health insurance and uh, I think this unwanted pregnancy, uh, it's just uh, all the birth control strategies are failed, then you just can go to abortion. So like normally what kind of, uh, I think this everyone should know, but I'm not sure how public in Germany, like what kind of strategy to use, uh, to be used to do birth control. And do you think it's necessary for the health insurance to include the birth control, let's say, uh, into the insurance, like, uh, like the pills and the condoms like I, I don't know yeah what's your opinions about yes I, I very much think that health insurance should cover uh, contraception all all the methods actually um, because it's it's basic uh, medical care to enable people to um, to realize family planning I mean that's that's not a luxury think that's something that uh, is part of our basic life everyday life um, and in many other european countries it is covered by health insurance so in germany it's covered actually until 22 years but after that it's not covered anymore so the state thinks apparently that after 22 years um you don't use you, you don't need to to prevent uh, pregnancies anymore because then you're old enough to to carry to, to raise a child <laughs> i don't know uh, so um yeah um it's 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 very important um but as i said it's also important to understand that it won't prevent uh, unwanted pregnancies um it, it might reduce a little bit but um, there are so many pregnancies that occur, even if you used contraceptives. So I have seen pregnancies with an IUD being correctly in place in the uterus, but there is still a pregnancy growing. So um, and also all contraceptives, almost all contraceptives have side effects, and some people have comorbidities that make it really difficult for them to find a suitable contraception so that can also be um, a reason why maybe they they can just use condoms in the end and condoms um, are not as safe as an IUD for example so um, this, these are also um, points that you should have in mind mm-hmm Okay, uh, maybe because it came up uh, a bit and I'm actually not really uh, too knowledgeable about it, but could you maybe say more specifically what the articles, I think, 2018 and 19 say? Like, you mentioned something about it being criminalizing the abortion itself, right? Um, and maybe also what they mean to you as a doctor. Um, yeah, so abortions in Germany are forbidden and you risk getting a penal or financial um, fine if you have an abortion just like that. But there are some exceptions in which you won't get punished. So one exception is um, the, the counseling indication. So most abortions go uh, via this indication, so 90 six percent of all abortions um, so you do the counseling you do the waiting period and then you can have the abortion but it's still unlawful then but you won't get a punishment um, but the state still makes very clear that um, he's not approving you to to have an abortion um, and then there are two more indications so when the the health of the pregnant person is endangered then it's the medical uh, indication 
then it's not unlawful so then it's it's legal you could say um and then you get it covered by health insurance and the third indication is criminal indication so after rape um then you also get it covered by health insurance and it's not unlawful but as i said 96 percent of all abortions go through the mm -hmm. counseling indication okay so uh, and um, does that mean that uh, like after this repeal just now basically things did not change much actually <laughs> no that they, they didn't that, that didn't change anything in this construct it's just okay. uh, it was 219a is just a small and uh, ridiculous paragraph from 1933 that uh, was prohibiting neutral information about abortions by abortion providers so basically it said um, you are not allowed to to either advertise or inform about abortions if you have a financial benefit from it and as doctors don't perform abortions for free, <laughs> um, they are so they are part of this paragraph. And if they put information, as the paragraph didn't differentiate between advertisement and information, so if they put information, they fell under this paragraph and they could get a fine. And um, this paragraph that no other country in Europe had anymore, so so we were the only ones who still had such a paragraph that was not even about abortion, but about the mere neutral information about abortion, that paragraph is luckily now uh, abolished, finally. Yeah. But it doesn't change that abortion is still uh, in the criminal code and mm -hmm. yeah, that there are all these barriers we mm -hmm. have that are against recommendations of World Health Organization mm -hmm. and um, UN, hum, UN mm -hmm. Human and the, the CEDAW Committee of the UN and so mm -hmm. on. Okay, so maybe we can move on to uh, you what you've been doing, like with the Doctors for Choice Germany. So um, maybe just quickly, can you uh, tell us like how you started this whole thing and how you then got into, I guess, um, how should I say, promoting uh, like the new regulations for uh, abortion and like, or how to also change the current system. Um, yeah, the, um, I co-founded Doctors for Choice when I was uh, graduating and became a doctor because I thought that this German-wide movement we now had among the students, uh, it would be good to have such a German-wide movement also in the area of, of doctors because there were some physicians already um, working in this area, but um, we didn't have a nationwide platform to connect um, and share our work and our experiences. And this is especially important for those living in, in rural areas where they are the only ones providing abortions because there the stigma is even higher. And um, it, I thought it would be very powerful to unite all these uh, voices throughout Germany and to, to have a more powerful lobby in within society and within medicine. And another important reason was these, this lack of abortion providers. I felt that um, we as physicians have a res responsibility to, to offer that medical treatment to our patients. I mean, it's, it's, why, it's, it's what we chose to do, actually. We, we chose... Uh, medicine and maybe we chose gynecology so that's part of it and I was actually missing that dedication in the professional gynecological associations and um, so Doctors for Choice was also founded to fill this gap and to, to um, have some influence on our colleagues. Yeah, and so we are we are now 170 members, mostly doctors and medical students, and we work basically in, in three areas. So one is medical education, so we assist medical students with their papaya workshops, or and we also um, offer credited online classes on abortion for doctors. You can um, access them on our 
web page um, to to fill in this this education gap and um, we also want to improve access so we um, we helped to build up a pilot pilot project for um, telemedical abortions so medication abortion that is performed via telemedicine to improve access in underserved regions and yeah also um, we we as I said we try to aim to motivate our colleagues we just started a campaign called in German ich mache Abbrüche und sie so I provide abortions and you and we have buttons and flyers and we go to gynecological congresses and speak to our colleagues and we have on our website information on how you can start to support this topic as a doctor so either how you start providing abortions or how you can support by offering information for example and one third big part of our work is PR so um, yeah um, lobbying giving interviews writing press releases um, we have an awareness campaign called mehr, mehr als du denkst more than you think so more abortions than you think less abortion providers than you think with um, with nicely illustrated fact sheets and mm -hmm. uh, yeah so on mm -hmm. no that that sounds great uh, and I mean how how uh, is your estimate of uh, the way the workshops and all of this um, education is going like are there a lot of attendees is the interest high or do you also have a lot of um, um, what do you call this opponents uh, that uh, try to um, I don't know negate the uh, the efforts you make yes um yeah of course we we face anti-abortionists um that are writing us and and um, leaving comments on social media and so on but actually i have the feeling that the support is bigger in total so um uh, there's a lot of support coming from from civilians and also many young doctors are interested in that topic so many of our members are young they are specializing in gynecology and they they say well at my in my hospital no one is advocating for this topic and no one performs abortions so i heard about you and i'm really um interested in that topic and i want to be different i want to provide abortions and um yeah i, I have the feeling that there is something changing but still in in the middle generation of those who are around 40 to 50 years old now there we have not many people who are engaged so this is the problem that many um, abortion providers are soon retiring or already retired and they don't find um, people to replace them so the next years i think the 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 bad access situation will worsen but i have hope for for the next let's say in, in, in 20 years maybe when all these medical students and young doctors are um, specialized so i think then it might change a little bit i'm, I'm hoping that and since we were talking abortion a lot just one question popped up in my mind like since one fourth of uh, people like let's say female could accord like abortion then is there any possibility to reduce abortion number it's also it's like why it's so much so many people who are doing abortion surgeries like it's because of awareness like they don't know uh, like i don't know I, i'm just curious now what, what was the measure measure to take to reduce them? Like uh, what kind of situation, like what kind of strategy or what kind of solution we could have to reduce abortion? Oh, the number in Germany, the abortion rate is is quite low. In the European comparison, it's already quite low. Mm -hmm. So we are good with this. Uh, we could we could reduce okay. it a little bit. As I said, like sell, um, sex education, uh, access to contraception, but we, we won't lower it very much more i think it's more we have more to accept it as as a part of human life it's it 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 happens so people have unwanted pregnancies they will always have they always had it and um 
we we cannot uh, we, we we cannot reduce that rate very much more. No, it's it's because people have a long fertile period in their life. They they are fertile between like from thirty five years. Um, people with an uterus can become pregnant, and if they have regular heterosexual intercourse, there is very often a chance to 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 become uh, pregnant. Okay, maybe uh, just to uh, quickly move, stay with the pro doctor's pro-choice. So you were also mentioning uh, the lobbying part. And I mean, on the one hand side, there's this uh, still the part of the like the ethics and the public, but on the other hand, the laws. And so do you think that like um, the current government or maybe the government, hopefully the next, I don't know, uh, would change the laws, the current laws? Um, that uh, like are criminalizing abortion and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we now have a unique chance. Actually, we never had that chance during the last sixteen years because we always had a, a government with the Christ Democrats um, being part of them, and with them actually no change was possible. But now we have a new coalition in which uh, two out of three parties are in favor of decriminalizing abortion and um, there will be an expert commission soon that will examine de decriminalization of abortion which is great and um, that some years ago we wouldn't have thought that this is possible actually um, but we will see um, I'm I'm very curious to see because um, yeah even if they decide on decriminalization that won't mean that the next day abortions are a normal medical intervention. So we need a, a whole bunch of regulations guaranteeing access. Um, and also we need a thorough debate in society uh, and within medicine um, to really destigmatize abortion and, and treat it as, as a normal medical intervention. And But what also makes me hopeful is when we look at um, recent developments in Europe, uh, in most countries, there are progressive steps taken. Like, for example, in the Netherlands, um, they they abolished the waiting period this year. In Spain, they are aiming to repeal also waiting period and and the the obligatory counseling and improve access. And uh, sometimes it can go very quick. Like in Ireland in two thousand eighteen, that's very catholic country that had one of the strictest abortion regulations in europe and um, then they after a great campaign and a civil referendum they now have uh, a more liberal abortion law than we have in germany so yeah sometimes it can go uh, quick and that makes that gives hope um even if, on the other hand, we also have countries like Poland who are um, who are who have rollbacks, severe rollbacks, and that and or like the U.S. and um, that also can happen, of course. But yeah, so so that, so in general, most countries are rather uh, taking progressive steps. Okay, no, I mean that's nice to hear. But still, I mean, for those countries like uh, as you mentioned, the states and uh, Poland. Um, are there like do you know people or doctors um, in those countries and how they deal with the situation because I mean you're completely dependent on the regulations in the country right mm, yeah the doctors um, yeah have to uh, stick to the legal regulations mm -hmm. if not they risk um, getting mm -hmm. a, a, a fine a p um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but what becomes very important in those countries is self-managed abortion, uh, which means that you um, get the medication sent via email from organizations. There exist a lot of uh, NGOs that send the medication, and then you can do the abortion at home. So that has become crucial in Poland and in the US, and that's very safe also. But of course, um, yeah. It, it's still, it's not what we want. If we want it to, to, to be part of the normal health system, of course. Okay. 
I mean, uh, I think we're like over time already. Uh, so I'm not sure if um, there's like a final question and um, share. Sure. I would like to end a final sure, question. Yes. So, since we we're talking abortion and at the beginning you also mentioned it's also very important to, for gender equality. If we have the normal abortion uh, laws and the normal procedure and uh, let's say you won't be discriminated or you won't be harassed by the people anti-abortion what can be or what uh, what kind of effect it would have to the gender equality situation like what uh, kind of effects it will have for the uh, this like uh, let's say diversity of society for the diversity you mean the yeah. and gender equality uh, for, um well it it would basically mean that all people can uh, decide on how many children they want to have at what time point and they can more um uh Uh, uh, they they can choose their their options more self determined and um, will will be more able to participate in 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 political processes. So it's also a de democratic question who who, who can yeah. <laughs> it's a very basic um, uh, question of uh, demo democracy. I mean, I'm not sure about the statistics there, but maybe also the uh, people that like have lower incomes and such are more likely to get an abortion. Uh, because they don't have the access to the health care and such. But uh, I wanted to say that at statistics uh, um, before, because sometimes people think that abortion seekers are mostly very young um, women, <laughs> but that's not true. So the people under 20 having an abortion, the, the amount is very small, and most people have abortions between 25 and 35 years. Um, and also I wanted to... I just had an um thought about when you were asking about how how we can reduce the abortion rate there is one important point that I sometimes as a doctor see that um some people would like to go on with the pregnancy but they can't because of financial reasons because they don't get enough support from the state for example um or because they don't have a partner who supports them so what we what we need to really uh, um, enable people to become parents that want to become parents is that we have to support them better um, financially um, and that we also have to integrate uh, men more into care work. So it has to become more normal that also men um, do care work so and, and provide their support for children so um, that that women can decide for for uh, going on with the pregnancy. Because th those are the reasons that make me most sad, because there is an actual wish for, for having that child and raising it, but there, there are no options for it. And I completely understand the decision then to, to not have that child, but um, it's sad because if external factors were different, this person could, could go on with the pregnancy. Since, since we're here, and I think uh, it's true, we need to give more support to the people who are not financially supportive. But I, I have to say something about the, the aesthetic. Uh, Nico just mentioned about poor people. That's actually a, there is a debate online. Like we couldn't discriminate people who are like, mm, we don't say it's poor. Like let's say financially, uh, not advantaged, but they have the right to have kids as well. Like it doesn't mean they're not have enough money, then they cannot raise a baby. 
decently. They can, but the society need to give them more support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About gender, yeah, I think we also need to give better education to the another role of gender. They should also, from their kids, they should be aware. Not their mama or their ma- mama need to take care of them. Their dad also need to have their responsibility in the whole family plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. And、uh, the situation in Germany at the moment is. Very bad for people with 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 less income. For example, when you um, receive um, unemployment benefit um, and you have children, then the the benefit you get for each child is、uh, is reduced from from your unemployment benefit. So it's not added, but it's it's it reduced from it. So、um, it it's really there is.、Uh, A strategy to make people who not don't have much money to rather、uh, not have many children, and that's that's of course not acceptable、mm-hmm. at all. Okay, I think、uh, this was a very nice、uh, discussion. Thanks a lot for uh,、um, yeah joining us for this interview. It was really great and educational. And I hope things will improve soonish. I'm I'm not sure how fast the current government in Germany, I guess, can do something. But、uh, yeah, hoping that things、uh, will get better soon. All right, then. Thanks again. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. <laughs> Thank you. It was、yeah. very nice talk. Yes. Thanks for the invitation. Nice. So now we're through with the interview, and I think this was really interesting and informative for me. I learned a lot of things today.、Uh, how about you? What did you think about the pod,、uh, the interview, Sharon?、Um, at the end, I really would like to emphasize it is very important for pregnant person to have rights to decide if they would like to get an abortion. This promotes more equality in society and allows a better family planning. So I completely agree with you.、Uh, with this, then、uh, we're done. And、uh, Offspring Magazine podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD in Science Communication Workgroup, known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro and outro music is composed by Srinath Ramkumar, and the pre-intro jingles composed by Gustavo Cadiz. So, if you'd like to give us any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us on Twitter at mppphdnetpodcast. With this, thanks, and see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.